Good evening, Claire, and good evening, everybody. Good evening. Glad to see you, having heard from you this afternoon. <laughs> anyway, Claire Cashmore from uh, the University of Hull. She's currently a postdoctoral doctoral researcher, and her focus is the evolution of galaxies in clusters which she investigates through running simulations on supercomputers to reveal the impact of the cluster environment on large timescales to allow us to understand how these galaxies are transformed. Observations only allow us to see a snapshot in time by comparing these computer simulations we hope to piece together the events that result in the galaxies we present, we presently, sorry, observe in clusters. So please everybody in a Mitchburn and Swinton way please welcome Claire Cashmore. Um, okay so thank you very much for um, for having me. Um, it's the first time I've done one of these on Zoom so uh, yeah it's quite different but um, here we go, so it's what we're going to do at the moment, isn't it? So, um, so I want to talk to you today um, about how the, the environment shapes the evolution of galaxies. Um, right, okay, so first um, I'd like to explain a bit what I, what I mean really when I say environment. Um, so we're basically sort of just describing the area around a galaxy. Um, so this is going to be things like how many, how many neighbours does the galaxy have, so how many other galaxies are around, um, how much hot gas is around the galaxy, maybe how much dark matter is around there, so we're really just describing the, the area around a galaxy. Um, so there are three regions that I'll refer to in this talk. So I'm just going to explain those here so they're sort of clear on the, the next few slides. Um, so when I say um, the field, basically I mean a, this is a region that contains very few, um, if any, galaxies. Um, you might see in a field really a galaxy sort of alone, that any other galaxies are very, very far away. Um, there, there aren't many galaxies in regions like this, but I'll talk more about that later. Um, the next region I'll speak about is groups. So this is up to 100 galaxies. So we're in a group, um, the Milky Way, called the local group. Um, and then we go up to clusters, which are very, very crowded and contain um, thousands of galaxies. Um, and these sort of regions that can have quite a large impact on the evolution of a galaxy. Um, so I'm just going to mention um, a bit about the, the structure of the universe. Um, so we know the universe um, isn't uniform at all. So it's not, we don't have lots of galaxies spread like evenly spaced. Um, we know that it, they tend to clump together in clusters and in groups. Um, and they're usually connected by thin strands of material um, like a spider web, like we see in this, in this image here. Um, so this was produced in the Millennium Simulation, which is an end body simulation um, using more than 10 billion particles. So an n-body simulation is basically just using sort of um, like billiard ball sort of particles and it doesn't really, they don't take into account things like actual gas properties like temperature and things like that. But this is just to see, you can, using this, you can sort of see how matter clumps together. And um, so you've got these, these bright yellow clumps here. This is sort of where you have like the most material and then the dark areas there are just pretty much empty space. Um, so yeah, so you can see the so the yellow clumps here are sort of the groups and clusters of galaxies, um, and so while galaxies um, do sort of move apart, like with the expansion of the, the general expansion of the universe, um, they also are attracted by gravity to sort of other well galaxy clusters and other just large large clumps of mass. So like as a consequence, of this relative to the overall expansion of the universe galaxies do move towards the densest areas and away from regions with very little mass, which we call voids. So these are going to be um, like the, these spaces here, the dark spaces, they move away from the voids and into the, the clusters. But then generally the big clumps of matter are moving away from each other. Um, so it was discovered in, in 1987 that the Milky Way is actually right on the fringe of one of these, one of these very large voids. Oh, sorry, where's my next there? And so, which is called the local void. Um, and most of these, these structures here, sort of from the beginning of the universe, they just get larger and larger and larger until you form sort of clusters of thousands of thousands of galaxies, um, forms at the sort of node of the webs here, which are the sort of the clumps. 
Um, and so while this is a, um, a dark matter simulation, um, the, the normal matter, the, the bionic matter that we're made up of, galaxies made up of, um, they follow the, the dark matter distribution. So we can sort of, um, you know, th this is the, the position of, of galaxies as well in here. Um, so, th so these runs actually took more than a month to simulate on the supercomputer at the Max Planck Society uh, Supercomputing Centre in Germany. This was like a huge, huge simulation. I think it's one of the, the largest that's been done so far. Um, so I just have a, a video of that here as well. Um, what is that? That's playing. Yeah, so this is just going from like a really, really large scale, so it's scales of gigaparsecs, and it's going to go down to the scale um, of a galaxy cluster just to show like the the structure of the universe and where all the mass is. Um, so it's such a, like a large scale, you know, the, these simulations, and that's why they take so long to run. Um, I'm again. So we're still not on a galaxy cluster scale yet. So most galaxies are in, in these groups or clusters that we can see sort of the yellow all the yellow regions here, but there are some sort of dotted about in lower density areas. So we're just coming into a sort of a, the scale of a galaxy cluster now. And so this is sort of in the, um, yes, yeah, so this is sort of in a galaxy cluster there. So it said my, I don't know if that, I don't know if that messed up my internet connection, but I seem to still be here, so that's okay. Um, and then it just goes back out um, to where we started. So you see like on, on a large scale, that's what the, you know, the structure of mass looks like. Um, and so where a galaxy is, sort of within this structure can have a, an impact on its evolution. Um, okay, so just a bit about field galaxies. So um, a field galaxy is a galaxy that doesn't belong to a large galaxy group or cluster. Um, so it's, it's gravitationally alone. It has no neighbours. There's nothing else. There's nothing else nearby. Um, most galaxies are in groups and clusters. So about 80 percent. Um, well, 80 percent of those that are within five megaparsecs of the Milky Way. But generally, most are anyway in the universe. Um, and then and around 75% of galaxies that are in the field are spiral galaxies. So these are yeah, galaxies with spiral arms. They're blue, they're star forming, um, they have lots of young stars. Um, so I'm going to talk more about that in a bit, um, about the types of galaxies. So this is just an example of a field galaxy, um, NGC 6503. So this has been has a nickname of the Lonely Galaxy. Um, so it's, it's about 20.4 million light years from Earth, and it's actually right on the edge of the, the local void. Um, so the Milky Way is quite near the local void, but then there's a lot more space, and this is sort of right on the edge of um, the local void. It's a huge, a huge empty space. There's nothing in it, no stars, no galaxies, um, no gas. And it's about, this local void is about 150 million light years across. Um, so it's actually, like a, it's a really huge space with nothing in it, so matter, it's sort of all attracted to all the matter and it clumps together then you have these huge spaces that are just just completely empty um okay then moving up we can go we get to we'll get to galaxy groups so galaxy groups in general can have a sort of a couple of hundred galaxies um we the milky way we're in a galaxy group um called the local group um, there's only sort of three three large galaxies um, really in this group. There's us as Andromeda and the Triangulum Galaxy, and the rest um, the rest are dwarf galaxies. Um, so, so I have on here more than fifty smaller planet dwarf galaxies, but I think there are a couple of hundred. So, so dwarf galaxies are just very very small galaxies um, that are orbiting around the large galaxies. But there's there's probably about a couple of hundred there because. Um, so in the last few years, the, the number that's been discovered has just gone up and up and up because we're just finding fainter and fainter and smaller and smaller galaxies that are within the local group. Um, but in terms of big galaxies, there's only sort of three, whereas in clusters, you'll find sort of thousands of Milky Way sized galaxies and larger. Um, it's, it has a diameter of about 10 million light years. Um, and it's on the, it is, it's on the outskirts of a giant supercluster galaxy known as a Virgo supercluster. So we're not we're not part of a cluster, but we're sort of near a cluster on the edge, but we're not gravitationally part of that cluster. Um, and just to show you the sort of structure of the local group, um, 
so I have made sort of this bit bigger just in case that didn't come up so well on a on a small screen. Um, so this is um, this does include all the dwarf galaxies. But you can here see here the, the Milky Way, Andromeda, and Triangulum there. And around each of these large galaxies, there's lots of orbiting dwarf galaxies. So these are sort of the main galaxies around the Milky Way, um, the most well known ones. But over the last sort of over the last sort of decade, I think the number of dwarf galaxies has tripled and possibly even quadrupled um, because of we, we have things like the um, SDSS survey, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey found a lot more and then the Dark Energy Survey I think found even more than that. Um, we just, because the telescopes are getting more and more powerful, we're finding sort of fainter and fainter dwarfs that are orbiting around the Milky Way. Um, but these are very, very small um, compared to the Milky Way. Um, but this is sort of our, our local group of galaxies um, gravitationally bound together. And so while there are quite a few galaxies there, most of them are very small galaxies there's still lots of space between so it's not um it's not a hugely crowded environment um and, mo and most groups are similar to this that we know of um so moving on to even larger structures galaxy clusters um are sort of the next step up and they're the most massive relaxed systems known in the universe um and these can contain thousands of galaxies um and even several thousands of galaxies um I was going to mention superclusters, but superclusters are a bit. Um, so superclusters are then sort of clusters of clusters, but it's not. We don't think that these are actually bound together by gravity, so we don't think they're sort of. Um, you know, they, they might sort of move away from each other at some point in the future. So the galaxy clusters are sort of the most massive bound systems that that we know of. Um, so galaxy clusters are good for studying large populations of galaxies because you've got you know thousands of galaxies together so you can look at all different types of galaxies in there there's different types of different sizes um you know you compare different you can compare different galaxies together um and we know they're all the same distance away from us as well if they're in the same cluster so we can um use that to explore galaxy evolution as well um you know some will be older some will be younger it's just a good sort of um it's a good sort of pot of galaxies to go and you know go and investigate explore properties and things like that so this is the the image of the coma cluster here and um, which is the the largest and most densely populated cluster that we know of and um, so every every sort of dot of light in this image is a galaxy um so you don't get um well the, the one i'll show you on the next page that has a lot of background stars in but every dot in this image is is a galaxy because there's that many in there um i think there's up to ten thousand galaxies in the coma cluster um and mo but most of these galaxies are elliptical galaxies, so they're all the, the rounded sort of, we we'll call them red, red and dead galaxies, um, rather than the, the nice sort of um, the blue star forming spiral galaxies, they're mostly elliptical. Um, you know, there's, there's tens of thousands in there, so that's a lots, lots of elliptical galaxies in there. Um, that's what I was going to say about that one, yeah. So moving on to the Virgo cluster, so this is a lot, well, it's a lot smaller than coma but it's the closest cluster to us so it's quite good to use for you know observations and looking at galaxy evolution because we can get some really good observations from there due to it being close um so the, this image shows the central regions of the virgo cluster um and you can make out the large galaxies sort of among the stars of the milky way so this the, i mean these are just the same picture but this one's got the um the circles around it to just show you where the the galaxies are so in this image you have got lots of stars in the background. Um, now this cluster is, has more of a mixture of spiral and elliptical galaxies, so while Coma is mostly elliptical galaxies and very few spiral galaxies, Virgo has a mixture of both. Um, and as I said before, we're not, we're not in a cluster ourselves, we're in the group, the Milky Way, but we're closest to like the, the Virgo supercluster, which contains the Virgo cluster as well. Okay, so talking about types of galaxies so just to like i know people have most likely seen this before but just to go over the um the morphological classification of galaxies so edwin hubble came up with this um the hubble tuning book um to describe the morphology of galaxies um so we have elliptical galaxies over there on the left um you know they get the the number increases depending on how how elliptical they are and then we've got the spirals on the right 
um you know the ellipticals are usually you know they're, they're round they're usually red in color because the stars are very old um and they, they stop forming stars so there's no new ones there um whereas spiral galaxies um are usually quite blue in color because they're still actively forming stars and they're quite and they're quite bright whereas elliptical galaxies can be dimmer well they're usually not too dim because they usually are very big so um you can still see them um so the reason uh, this is interesting because we think that um when galaxies are young and they're, they're forming stars they have lots of gas um they they are spiral galaxies they tend to be spiral galaxies anyway or irregular galaxies you can just have a an irregular shape but you're still blue and star forming um and then over time whether the galaxy whether the, the galaxy just gets older runs out of gas and stops forming stars and then the stars form um the stars turn red because they're old or with the environment or a mixture of both the spiral galaxies will transform into more like elliptical type galaxies so we'll go from a nice blue star forming spiral galaxy or regular galaxy to a sort of round red dimmer um elliptical galaxy um and these sort of both both factors but um you can see in in the field almost all galaxies are the are blue star forming spiral galaxies whereas in ellip in clusters we see a lot more elliptical galaxies um so this is the known as the morphology density relation um so is there a lot um, and then the density is increasing this way so that's just more galaxies in in a given space um i don't know if this come up very well but this is an elliptical galaxy here and this is so this is the red line this is a spiral galaxy here the blue line um and as you can see we find more spiral galaxies so there's a much larger number of spiral galaxies here in the low density environments and as you move up and go to higher and higher densities we find um fewer and fewer spiral galaxies um, whereas elliptical galaxies we don't find many of those in um the low density environments like in the field or in in groups but as you go to higher and higher and higher density environments you find more elliptical galaxies um so this trends this this black line is just a like the total number of galaxies um but there seems to be sort of a clear um a clear trend that we find we mostly find spiral galaxies in uh, in the field or in groups or possibly on the outskirts of clusters because that's not um as high density but when you're going to when you sort of move towards the center of clusters and you get to high density areas with more and more galaxies and sort of more and more gas around as well because there's not just you know we within a cluster in between galaxies there's lots of gas there's some stars as well that have formed outside galaxies or have been like pulled from galaxies um, but that's a high density environment in the center of a cluster and that's where the number of spiral galaxies really drops and we find more and more ellipticals um so we find uh, galaxy properties do vary with environment so the shape of galaxies vary with environment we're more likely to find round galaxies in central clusters the color so more likely to find red galaxies in the central clusters because the stars are old um, the amount of star formation varies, um, so more likely to find the, the ellipticals in the centre, they have stopped forming stars or pretty much stopped forming stars, whereas the blue spiral galaxies are still forming lots of stars. Um, and so things like whether or not it's an active black hole, that changes with the environment as well. Um, so galaxies in the densest regions are mostly um, older, rounder, and as far as star formation is concerned, like dead. Um, so the big question really is how has this happened so there's there's an option that one option is it's down to nature so maybe the galaxies in the densest regions form first so when we look at uh, remember the um, image of the structure of the universe maybe the galaxies that were right in the center of those clumps form very early on so they've had more time to sit around and just become like old and boring stop star formation turn dim um in essence so they've had like a head start um but it's, it's most likely that it is down to nurture so the, the environment has um, an important role to play um, so there's quite a few different things going on in in cluster environments that can um oh sorry i've got this one i'll just talk to this one first just briefly so this is just different environments um so we have a massive cluster here intermediate mass 
low mass crew and isolated galaxies. And really, I suppose the, the important thing here is the elliptical galaxies E, this line, and the spiral galaxies SP, this line here. The rest are just uh, yeah, SI galaxies in the middle and dwarf ellipticals. So you can see in a massive cluster like Coma, you have quite a lot of elliptical galaxies, so this line here, um, and few spiral galaxies. And then as you move on to the intermediate cl mass cluster like Virgo, you've got a lot more spiral galaxies, fewer elliptical galaxies. As we move to a low mass group, we're pretty much dominated then by spirals. Um, and this is dwarf regulars here. Um, so even the dwarfs haven't sort of turned red and dead in a low mass group. Um, and then isolated galaxies, pretty much all spirals, dwarf irregulars. So um, if you go to the, the highest density environments, you've got most ellipticals, not very many spirals, and then it sort of becomes um, more even and goes the other way. Field galaxies, you've got mostly spirals, very rarely see ellipticals. Um, so there's different processes in a cluster environment that can cause galaxies um, to sort of make this transformation from a blue star to star forming spiral uh, to a red and dead elliptical. Um, so these are just briefly here and then I'm going to talk about them more in a bit. So you have gas starvation or strangulation, um, which is removal of the hot gas halo once the galaxy falls into the cluster. Um, galaxy mergers, which uh, give a strong internal dynamic response, tidal stripping, which is the removal of gas and stars through gravitational forces, um, and gas stripping, which is stripping of the cold gas, and that has an indirect influence on the morphology of the galaxy as well. Um, so just in a bit more detail, um, galaxies or spiral galaxies usually have um, like a, a sphere of gas around them, so you've got the, the disc with the spiral arms in and then a gas, like a, a sphere of gas around, which is quite low density. Um, but because this is low density, when it falls into the cluster, this hot gas halo is just removed. Um, this like, removes a lot of gas, but obviously the, the, there's still gas in the plane of the galaxy, and so the galaxy can still keep forming stars. Um, however, the stars that are being formed are consuming the gas faster than it can be replenished by either gas from the halo or from elsewhere. Um, and so eventually the, gal the galaxy keeps forming stars, uses up all its gas, um, runs out of gas, and then it effectively starves to death. So it's got nothing else to make stars with, um, stops forming stars, the stars go red and sort of die off, and then we have a very dim galaxy. This is quite a slow process because it'll take a long time to use up that gas. Um, And then galaxy mergers. So these are more obviously more frequent galaxy clusters because there's a lot more galaxies. Um, there's a lot more galaxies around to merge with. Whereas if you're in like the local group, although there's quite a lot of dwarf galaxies, they're very small. There's lots of space in between, so it's not going to happen as often. Um, these are quite um, like violent interactions, really, where the galaxies are pretty much ripped apart and sort of reassembled over time. So. I mean, these, these events happen on, on billions of year time scales um, and each pair of galaxies we observe sort of provides a snapshot in time of what's happening there. Um, so the stars are, are too spread out to really hit each other, but they can sort of go through each other and be dragged out the other side. So we get these sort of um, these tails. So I think I've got another example on the next slide, but we get these tails that stick out here. Um, it sort of drags material gas and stars out of the galaxy um, and it completely this is going to completely change you know the shape of the galaxy and um, the morphology of the galaxy it's never going to look the same as it did before before the merger happened um, so yeah they, they happen on um, time scales of billions of years so when we look at when we see these galaxies merging so these are just some nice um, really nice images from Hubble um, we can see that they're merging, but we can't, um, we don't know what's happened before or after. You know, we're not going to be able to figure that out from, from observing them because it's just going to take too long. But what we can do is compare these um, with computer simulations. And it, obviously, if we, get, if we get something similar to the observations in the simulation, then we can understand more about the process and what happens sort of before and after, or what's happening to the gas and stars um, inside the galaxy. Um, so I've got a nice video here. So this is, um, this is a computer simulation, but they, they've stopped it. Um, I think most images from that page actually, but they, they've stopped it at certain um, points and it looks just like the, some of the 
images that were on the slide before of these merging galaxies here. And so with this, so obviously all the, all the movements are a simulation, but with this we can try and understand more about what happens to galaxies and how they transform from one type to another. So this is the Hubble image here. So it looked, that was a computer simulation, they put the Hubble image up on top of it, being like this is, this looks like this pair of merging galaxies. Um, and then it'll do it again in a, in a minute. And then you've got your Hubble image here of this. So, although we can't sort of know exactly, it gives us a good idea of what, you know, what's been happening before and after and what these galaxies might look like after they've merged. There's another Hubble image there. So that if we see one sort of at a late stage, we could say like, well, um, that galaxy more, was more than likely involved in a merger in the past because it looks a bit like this now. But this completely transformed galaxy, you can see the, the gas that's being pulled out here, that's the Hubble image again, so it keeps stopping and putting the image on. The gas that's been pulled out here, um, it's been taken out of these galaxies and that's not available for star formation anymore. So if these galaxies are going to stop forming stars, they're going to become red and dead um, elliptical galaxies. So it might go into the merger as a, as a star forming spiral and come out of the merger, well, come out of the merger with a complete different morphology and then over time it will become red and dead as the stars that were there get older and older. Um, so an, another process is tidal stripping. Um, so this is um, when a large galaxy pulls gas or stars or both from a smaller galaxy because of strong tidal force. So this is a result of gravitational interaction between galaxies. So you might have galaxies that rather than actually merge and, and collide with each other they just have a close passage but because the gravitational interaction is very strong, that close passage can pull pull things out of one, well, it'd be the larger one pulling it out of the smaller galaxy um, if the gravitational force is large enough. Um, so this is just an example of a, a tidal tail. So you saw the tails in the merger just, but you can, um, you can sort of get features like that without actually colliding, but with, have, with a close passage. Um, I just have a nice example of this in the, the Milky Way. Um, so the large and small uh, Magellanic clouds are regular dwarf galaxies and um, probably the most famous thing you can you can see both of the naked eye depending on where you are I guess and how good the sky is. Um, this, well they, they've both been tidally stripped by the Milky Way so this shows, um, sorry, um, so this shows sort of the extent of the, um, the stripped gas so you've got the galaxies over here and, and all of this is just gas that's been pulled out of these galaxies as they're orbiting around the Milky Way. Um, we can't see this gas with the, uh, in optical, this is in um, neutral hydrogen that's, that's emitted this. So it's only visible in radio emission. Um, but this gas has been pulled from the large and small Magellanic clouds as they're orbiting around the Milky Way. Um, there's no star system, this is just gas. Um, so yeah, this is the, you know, this is quite, um, extreme because they're very small compared to the Milky Way but this can still happen in clusters with two large galaxies you might just not see as um, it just won't be as extreme but you can still pull gas out of the galaxies and then again that that gas is not available for stars um, so they are still the LMC and SMC are still forming stars at the moment presumably in the future as they keep sort of going around using up their gas and gas is being pulled out by this tidal stripping um, that there'll be less nest gas for stars and they'll stop at some point. Um, another really nice example of tidal stripping in, in our group around the Milky Way um, is a Sagittarius stream. So this time this is stars that have been pulled out of the, the dwarf galaxy rather than gas. Well, gas has as well, but this is like this is a stellar stream. Um, so there's a trail of stars that trace the orbit of the dwarf around the Milky Way. So Sagittarius used to be one of the, the brightest satellites of the Milky Way. Um, but it's now just a, a small, disrupted sort of core that's just um, sort of a, a lot fainter and not, I'll say not as interesting, it is interesting because of what's happened to it, but it's, it's now just a small, disrupted core of what it used to be. It's like half the gas and stars have been lost because they've been pulled out of the gas, they've just been pulled out by gravitational force as, as it orbits around the Milky Way. Um, again, this is th these are in our group. I'm talking about clusters being the environments where, um, you know, 
galaxies have really transformed but these are good examples because these dwarf galaxies are very small compared to the Milky Way so you can see sort of a, a very clear example um, whereas in clusters you would still get this stripping of gas and stripping of stars um, it's harder to observe obviously because it's further away so we have these really nice examples in the local group but this will happen on the cluster scale as well and then you wouldn't get sort of um, you know this amount of stars and gas being pulled say out of Andromeda by the Milky Way as it comes closer because Andromeda is larger so it has its own large gravitational force. Um, the last process I'm going to talk about is, is ram pressure stripping. Um, so ram pressure stripping is um, like an additional pressure that cr is created when an object moves through like a fluid medium basically. So um, if you're running or you're cycling into the wind and you can feel sort of the wind on your face, that's like a, basically a ram pressure. Um, you know, if you were to hold the hairdryer in front of your face and you felt the air on your face, that's a ram pressure. So this is what, this is basically the same as what galaxies experience when um, they fall into clusters, whilst they're on a larger scale. Um, so in, in clusters, you have all these galaxies and in between the galaxies is um, a lot of hot gas. Like, um, this is millions of degrees, this hot gas. Um, and as a galaxy falls into a cluster, it, it hits this hot gas. Um, and if the pressure of this, um, the gas that hits the galaxy, is stronger than the gravitational force that's holding the, the gas within the galaxy, it can actually push gas out of the galaxy. Um, so this gas is pushed out of the galaxy and then it, it trails behind the galaxy. So you sometimes get these really long tails of gas um, behind the galaxy that's been pushed out through this pressure from the hot gas in the cluster. Um, so this is really strong when you have um, a really high galaxy velocity. So the faster the galaxy is uh, falling into the cluster, the stronger the ram pressure will be. And also the more gas that's in the cluster, the stronger the ram pressure will be. Um, so less massive clusters have weaker ram pressure and more massive clusters have stronger ram pressure. Um, this is a very fast process, so we can move a lot of gas very quickly. Um, compared to things like um, strangulation, which is slow, and mergers, which may or may not happen. It's not going to happen necessarily to every single galaxy that's in the cluster. Um, so this is a very good way to move, a to move a lot of gas fast and to switch off star formation in the galaxy. And then it's going to turn it into like a, a red and dead galaxy. Um, again, it's another nice video. I don't know whether this sound's going to come on here. I know this is really loud. Oh, it's not that loud, I'll just leave on. This is just a computer simulation um, of a galaxy being stripped. So you can see all this gas, I hope you can hear me, being pulled from the disk. So I was trying to find a way to mute it so it didn't play at all, but I couldn't figure out how to do it. So you can see the gas being pulled off the disk as it as it falls into the galaxy. Um, but so that's a computer simulation, but there's a lot of um there's a lot of observations. So I have one. Okay, so um, it's easy to see in these galaxies. So jellyfish galaxies, just, just quickly, because they're quite interesting, are a ram pressure stripped galaxy, basically, um, with a twist. So this is what happens when you get ram pressure stripping. You have this long tail of gas um, lagging behind the galaxy uh, that's been pushed out of the disk. So this is um, ESO 137001 um, in the Norma cluster, and it's traveling up here to the top left of the box at about I think it's 4.5 million kilometers an hour into the cluster. All of this gas has been pulled out of the disk by run pressure as it's moving forward and there's still gas in disk at the moment so it's still bright, it's still star forming but when that gas has been used up or more has been removed as it gets closer and closer to the centre it will stop forming stars and it won't be nice and blue and spirally anymore. So this tail, um, the, 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 ga the hot gas in the normal cluster is very, very hot. Um, so it's millions of degrees um, hot. So this is actually very bright in X-ray, this tail. So this is, this is in X-ray, the blue. Um, this is just a close-up of um, near the disk. So jellyfish galaxies are, are jellyfish galaxies because they're galaxies that have had stars forming the gas that's been stripped from the disk. So the gas that's been stripped from the disk, if it can, if you've still got dense clumps, 
um, you can possibly form stars away from the disk, so it's extra galactic star formation. Um, and then because they're bright in the UV and possibly the optical as well, it looks like they have tentacles and that's why they're called jellyfish galaxies. Um, so you have strip galaxies where the gas has just been stripped um, and then you can get star formation in that strip gas as well. Um, and that's what we call jellyfish galaxies. So these are quite, um, these are all quite, um, I wouldn't necessarily all quite violent processes, but they're all very, all of these processes have, can have a really big impact on the galaxy itself um, and its ability to form stars. Oh, sorry, there's just one more quick jellyfish galaxy here. This is a dwarf in the Virgo cluster. And this is just quite interesting because this used to be, there's a star in this tail. So all the blue here is UV emission. And there's a star in this tail that used to be the furthest star um, that had ever been observed. Well, that was overtaken not long ago by a star that had been gravitationally lensed. But this was this used to be the first star that had been observed, and it was outside of a galaxy, which is quite interesting. Um, and they think this is um, evolving from a dwarf irregular into a dwarf elliptical. So we're sort of possibly looking at a transformation taking place here. Um, it's going to become a dwarf elliptical when its gas has um, been stripped, and that obviously that affects its morphology as well. Um, so to to summarise, sorry, I hope I haven't been talking too long. So um, to summarise, the, the effect of the environment is clear on the fraction of star forming galaxies. So as we go to a high density environment, like the centre of a cluster, there's less star forming galaxies. Um, they're they're mi mainly all red and dead. Um, morphological distribution. So as we go towards the centre of the cluster, they're mainly round um, rather than sort of thin with spiral arms or just irregular galaxies. And then we find the spiral galaxies in the field or in low mass groups. Um, and the gas distribution in falling galaxies. So as, again, as we go to the center of a cluster, um, we have galaxies that um, have no or very little gas. Whereas if we look in the field, they're all gas rich galaxies and they're all um, forming lots of stars. Um, and so the, the cluster environment is, is very, very harsh and it can transform sort of blue spiral star forming galaxies into red and dead elliptical galaxies. Um, so the cluster can change morphology, which is the shape and appearance of galaxies. So a galaxy that goes in as a nice blue spiral, um, you know, can look in the centre of the cluster a long time later as a red round galaxy and reduces their gas mass. They can go in gas rich, happily forming lots and lots of stars. but through things like tidal stripping, ramp pressure stripping, mergers, starvation, there's no gas left to form any stars, so they just stop and then they become red, um, so, which goes into turning off their star formation. Um, so yeah, we find in the centre, we find the round, red, uh, non-star forming galaxies, and then in low density environments like our local group or in the fields, we find lots of nice blue star forming spiral galaxies. So the environment does play quite a big part on them. Um, on the evolution of the galaxy. Um, I think that is it for me. So yeah, so thank you very much for listening and I'll happily answer any questions you have. Thank you very much, Claire. Uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to ask for questions. So okay. if I just cancel your spotlight and can you cancel your sure. screen sharing? Okay, and if I go back to gallery view, so hopefully everybody can see everybody else now. And uh, what we will do is ask for uh, questions. So while everybody's thinking their questions, I've been making some, uh, jotting some, a few things down. Uh, right at the start of your talk, you talked about superclusters not yeah. being uh, gravitationally bound. And that's a little bit counterintuitive that the biggest structures in the universe uh, don't seem to uh, be following the same laws as everything else? Well, the universe, I think, I think it's not completely clear whether they are or they aren't. So maybe I shouldn't have said they're definitely not gravitationally bound. But I think it's, it's very hard to sort of tell from observations um, because they're so big. You've got, I mean, clusters are absolutely huge. And then a supercluster is a cluster of clusters. So this is a really, really, really large area. Um, so you need to sort of look at the velocities over, you know, large periods of time, probably longer than our lifetimes to be sure. But the universe is expanding as well. 
so there's this sort of fight between you know am i moving away from everything else or am i attracted to the you know whatever i'm in a group or a cluster or um you know it's that sort of balance between so i think we don't know whether because um so your yeah, galaxy clusters while they're very very big they're still quite compact whereas super clusters say then you've got a galaxy cluster say here a galaxy cluster there a galaxy cluster there and we're not we're not completely sure whether this whole huge structure is gravitationally bound or not because there's still the expansion of the universe as well so there's definitely not it's not really anything to worry about i don't think because we just don't know um you know matter is definitely you know clumping together but the universe is also expanding as well so i think it just depends it is just a, a really really huge scale so it's not quite definite at the moment so okay well if you've that, got... so that doesn't really answer your question but it's one of those kind of wavy things <laughs> okay we'll so... give you guys a few more years to observe <laughs> maybe maybe a couple of thousand hundred thousand yeah. and uh, that'll give you the definitive now ladies and gents uh i'm looking for hands or i'm looking for uh blue hands all right uh peter lloyd can you unmute your thank you peter yes thank you claire that that was a very stimulating talk that is uh, so forgive me if i'm uh, my question appears somewhat muddled but uh, and, and actually in your slide 22 you showed the sagittarius uh, galaxy stripping uh, gas from the milky way if i understood it correctly now, now what i'm wondering is those uh, tails that you see do those follow the orbit of the interacting galaxy? I guess they do, yeah. They, they follow the orbit of the star. Claire, can, uh, we've just lost your uh, picture and your sound. Orbit, sorry, it was before. Okay, I'm sorry about that, Claire. We missed all of that. Sorry. So can you give the answer again, please? I shouldn't have asked the question. We lost you again, Claire. Oh, sorry. See, my screen keeps free. Uh, okay claire uh if you want to type out your answer yeah. and then i will relay them okay. i think that's the best way to do that yeah okay um we're having a good evening this evening aren't we I hope everybody's happy about it. Ah, <laughs> oh, the wonders of technology. There you have it. I don't know whether you can hear me now or... Because okay, my, my got, screen keeps freezing. Right, we've got you back. You've just typed, uh, yes, the star oh, stripped out from the dwarf galaxies, trace the orbit, and that's the short answer. Yeah. <laughs> In that case, on your slide, the orbit seemed to be an extraordinary one. It seemed to be sort of go round in a in a in equatorial and turn itself into a polar orbit can that be true yes yeah, so hopefully this can you hear me at the moment yes we can That's it, yeah um so when these um like none of these orbits are really nice and um circular i mean they're nothing like galaxies orbit around galaxies really and nothing like sort of planets say orbiting around the sun um, so you have you have these clumps of gas like I showed in the in the, sort of the structure of the universe sort of image um, and, and these galaxies are really falling in at really high speeds so they're just being dropped into this sort of um, gravitational potential and then it sw it'll be pulled in by the Milky Way swing back round and then might go somewhere else so they're not a nice circular orbit um, because it's quite it's, it's not the way they're sort of built up um, it's a large scale and it's it's strong forces it's it's quite different to say the solar system and um, we say that the, the orbits are highly 
you know, the, the very regular, which is why stripping actually is, is very interesting for that as well, because we can see what its orbit was like in the past. Okay, Kepler's laws don't apply. Yeah, yeah, in this case, yeah, no. Thank you. Okay, we've got to, uh, Tony Morris. Can you unmute yourself, please, Tony? I'm unmuted. Oh, okay, Tony. Right, I've got to ask the question. On these very, very large scales, how does dark matter come into play? Um, well, dark matter... Oh, I'm not sure I'm asking anymore. I don't know if you remember the, um, the image I showed with the structure of the universe. Um, that, that was basically dark matter, the dark matter distribution um, in the simulation. Um, so galaxies, basically, all of normal matter um, traces the dark matter. Um, so it's just an underlying mass. So, um, so in a cluster you have um, like the dark matter mass, the density is highest at the centre. And that's why everything is sort of falling to the centre. So say when you have these galaxies falling, like the, the Sagittarius dwarf with that weird orbit or the galaxies in clusters, they, they fall in and they're heading towards the centre because that's where the most, the most mass is and the highest density is. Um, so we're pretty sure, obviously we can't see the dark matter, but from, from computer simulations where we have both dark matter and we have regular matter, the, the regular matter traces the dark matter. Um, there's just more dark matter there than regular matter but the the pattern the distribution um is is the same so does that answer your question yeah yeah it's fine thank you okay uh anybody else with any other questions uh peter morris can you unmute yourself please yes i was just wondering i mean spiral galaxies obviously become elliptical galaxies so i, I assume that Elliptical galaxies can never become spiral galaxies. What prevents an elliptical galaxy from ever becoming a spiral galaxy? Um, uh, that's quite. Um, I don't know if it's a way to sort of answer this without sort of getting into too much detail. But to form to form spiral arms is very hard. Um, for a start, so well, so first of all, elliptical galaxies don't really have much gas at all so you would have to get some gas from somewhere to sort of be gas rich again and in a cluster that's not really going to happen um but the actual the actual structure of a spiral arm so it's a very flat it's a flat disc with spiral arms um and to get this structure um you basically need it's sort of the way i don't know without sort of talking a lot about angular momentum i'm not sure or how to explain it so gas sort of falls in you have a dark matter halo and then gas starts falling into this to form a galaxy um and then because energy gets converted into angular momentum you have this it starts sort of spinning and then that's what sort of starts to form the flat disc and then you get these spiral arms formed as well so you'd need to just sort of you need to start from the start really to form spiral arms in a, in a flat disc you need to sort of start from scratch so if you were an elliptical galaxy, you've already got all that mass, you've got lots of stars, um, you already have a structure, so you're not really able to form a flat disk with spiral arms from there because you need to you need to start from scratch, I guess, to do that. Um, but also elliptical galaxies are red because they have old stars. Um, so you'd need lots of new stars if you want to become blue and star forming again, and you'd need lots of gas to form those stars. Peter, is that okay? Yep, okay. Has anybody else got uh, a question? I'm uh, looking around, I can't... Uh, oh, Peter Lloyd. If you're short of questions, um... The other one, the thing I was quite interested in, your, your, the, the jellyfish galaxies and the, the, what do we call them, the legs or the arms? The uh, tentacles, yeah. They shine in the x-ray, as I understood it. Does that um, mean... Well, the, the gas that, shines, so the, yeah, the gas shines in the x-ray and the stars are in UV and optical. That's what I thought. So does, does that mean those tails are extremely hot? Yes. Yeah, the gas in them is very, very hot, yeah. Why? Uh, well, the, it's because the cluster gas is hot. So, in a in a cluster, the gas is sort of millions of degrees, millions of degrees Celsius. How oh, is it? 
yeah and so when it goes into that environment out of the galaxy it mixes and then gets very hot as well that's what causes this big pressure you see that's what the because it's this dense hot gas it's a lot of pressure that's on the galaxy when it falls in it pushes that that gas out yeah it's very very hot um it's it's mainly hot because of i mean there's a lot of um there's a lot of activity going on but there's lots of things like um you know, there's active galactic nuclei in the center of the cluster um, that, that chuck out a lot of energy and that heats all the gas up as well. Um, so it's all, it's quite hot ionized gas. So yeah, and the gas that's pulled out is quite hot as well. But that's why it's surprising that some of that gas can form a star to make a jellyfish galaxy. So we don't completely understand this, there's somehow pockets of gas that stay cooler within that hot gas that can form stars and that's one of the things that I'm interested in that I'm looking at in my work at the moment so I think it's really interesting so oh, thank you okay uh, I don't see any other questions Claire thank you very much for a really interesting uh, talk I'm sorry that the whole telephone system is uh, <laughs> causing us uh, hassle uh, but it's been true for years and years. Uh, so uh, can we give Claire uh, Cashmore a big Mexper and Swinton thank you in our usual manner. Thank you very much, Claire. Thank you very much. And thank you so much for listening to me as well, inviting me. So, thank you.